So I want to welcome everyone. Uh, uh, thanks to those of you who carved out some time early on a Friday afternoon to make sure you could join us for our poster session. Um, I'm actually really excited to see posters in this way. I think sometimes there's silver linings in, uh, in what we're going through. Uh, each of the poster authors did a great job on these videos they're going to share, and I think the PowerPoints actually will give a wider audience an opportunity to see these, these cases in this research. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you all came in on mute, but you have the controls to mute or unmute yourselves. Um, I'll only mute, mute you if we're experiencing some background noise that, that I'm having trouble uh, figuring out a way to solve. Uh, we are planning to record the meeting and uh, to share with others who aren't able to attend. Um, if you are uh, participating by phone, be sure to identify yourself when you come off mute. And if you're at a computer that might uh, be someone else's and your identifying window has a name that isn't your own, it will help us if you take a minute and change that name so that those who don't know you well um, will be able to identify you. Um, and with that said, it's it's my pleasure next to uh, turn this over to our moderator who's given us a great amount of his time and leadership this year, our president, Dr. Don Fowles. Thank you, Dr. Fowles. Thank you, thank you Taryn. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this afternoon. Um, we definitely appreciate your uh, participation here and, um, and also your ongoing support of the association. Um, the uh, poster session is named in honor of Arizona Psychiatric Society member and early psychiatrist, career psychiatrist, Yukari Kawamoto, a respected mentor, colleague, and friend to many of us at Desert Vista, the Creighton Residency Program in our community. And uh, we had the good fortune to know and work with her. We thank our members who have volunteered their time to serve as judges uh, for, the, uh, for our resident fellow posters. And we thank each of our poster authors for adapting to this new format and a comment on our tra transition to virtual and PowerPoint presentations. As each poster is introduced, we will have a chance to enjoy together their recorded presentation. And the authors are joining us live for a brief Q&A to follow. So as this is a uh, new format, we appreciate your patience and understanding. I had a, I was, uh, I'm on the uh, board of COPA Health and we had a fundraiser last night, a gala that went, it actually went quite well. We raised a lot of money for, for the nonprofit, but the gal who was moderating thought we wanted to stop everything at 6.20 and not 6.30. So it was one of those glitches that happens in the virtual world, but it was all good. So we may have a few of those ourselves, so bear with us, uh, be patient. I'm sure we'll, we'll get through it here. So, um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Dr. Arant, Nicholas Arant, with the first poster, Baby Steps to Attachment Theory, um, and um, from the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And the second author on this is Dr. Allison Peet. So Nick, it's all, so it's all Dr. Doctor Arant, I, I get to take over virtual you, and we'll see the real you after your presentation. All right. Hi there. My name is Dr. Nick Arant. Oops. I think you might be on mute, Dr. Aaron, because we don't hear you. Yeah, yeah, you're on. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, I believe I recorded this earlier, so the pre-recording will have to play. As much as I just want to wing it, what I'm actually saying here. So I think Terry will have to unmute it or share screen with audio. Maybe. Hey, Terry. Terry is so on you know, mute. We yeah. are presenting the poster virtually, so if everyone would, would stay on mute, Dr. Arndt will uh, be able Presentation. to uh, answer the questions live. So that's just a learning curve moment there for us on, All right. on that. Very good. 
Hello. So if so, we'll just ask everyone to be on mute while we play the Dr. Arndt's poster. All right. Hi there. My name is Dr. Nick Arndt. I'm a psychiatry resident at I can't hear. Hey, Terry, you're on mute again. Um, thank you for taking a look at our poster. Don't worry, I won't stay in the zoomed out version where there's tiny text. Um, just wanted to give a little bit of background of why um, Allison and I did this um, quality improvement project. We found that the introduction of attachment theory in our residency felt like it was a little bit late. Um, we only, we had our first attachment theory lecture about halfway through second year. Um, and by that time we had a ton of exposure to psychiatric patients. And really we only got into the weeds of attachment um, during third year while working on therapy um, in our outpatient year. And it just seemed like such a critical theory that um, we would like to have it introduced later if possible. And this was um, just a pilot to see how the introduction of the content earlier in the um, residency could improve resident understanding. So I won't read through all of this, but essentially it says, you know, attachment theory is important Attachment theory, it doesn't, it's not well grasped usually by our younger psychiatric residents and our hypothesis that the early introduction to the basics of attachment theory will improve um, the resident's understanding of their patients. We uh, noted a primary um, goal of improving understanding of uh, residents' patients and the secondary aim or goal was to improve their understanding of attachment theory. So we kind of went for a bigger picture um, as our primary aim and then narrowed in for our secondary. As far as how the um, intervention was conducted, we surveyed both the PGY1s and the PGY2s before and after the intervention. And the intervention was um, about a 30 minute in-person lecture with a corresponding handout, which we'll talk about. The survey questions that we went through are in regards to our primary and secondary aims. The primary being, I have a well-rounded well understanding of my patients. And I have, and this is a negative question. I have difficulty coming up with the psychological formulation of my patients. And then this other half is more in regards to attachment. I find patients with borderline personality disorder draining. I have a good understanding of attachment theory and I know how to apply attachment theory to my patient's assessment and treatment plan. Of note, um, only half of the PGY2 psychiatry residents were present for the intervention. Um, two of them were on night flow, three of them were out. This did serve to kind of cut the second year class in half. And while we considered just administering it to the uh, second half on another date, like a month later, um, we decided to just let them be a control group and see what happened. So this is the intervention handout. Um, I won't go through this in depth, but essentially we did a little bit of fill in the blank about what attachment theory is and then the four basic types of attachment, which would be avoidant, secure, um, anxious, and disorganized. And some of the synonyms that are commonly thrown out, which are confusing, like avoidant versus dismissive or anxious versus preoccupied um, in some case examples. These are the results of our study. Um, as we noted, um, all the PGY ones are present for intervention. Six were present for the intervention and that's the PGY2 active and five were not, and that's the PGY2 controls. So in each of these, you'll see the three bars, um, blue being PGY ones, orange being the twos that were active and the, the gray being PGY twos that were controlled. So in regards to these first three questions, Really, we found that overall, the, both the ones and the twos fell within a pretty similar range um, 
in general, we saw the second years score a little bit better, um, but not more than a point apart. And this is on a one to five scale. So these are all within kind of the one point agree range. And really there wasn't a big change overall um, post intervention for any of these three groups. And really the, the bigger changes were seen a little bit in the PGY2 controls they apparently had a worse understanding of their patients after a six month period, or just, uh, it was by a half of a point on average. Um, and then on this third category, it seems that the, the control group found borderline patients more draining and over time that reduced slightly. But since those were the controls, we didn't see that to be um, due to our intervention. And then more specifically on the secondary aim, we did show some improvements. Interestingly, the PGY1s and PGY2s were like packed in there in the same um, area of answering on the baseline at uh, just below neutral or halfway between neutral and disagree. And overall they went up about a point or three quarters of a point um, on regards to question four. And we found that the PGY2s tended to improve a little bit more including the PGY2 control, which I wouldn't expect. And in regards to the second question of applying attachment theory, that was even further down on the disagree. Um, and, and overall, uh, similarly, there was a half point to full point improvement with better improvements in the PGY2s. This is just looking at the statistical significance of the change um, since it was within just kind of a one point change. As you can see here, most, most everything fell between the zero and one range. Um, the only place that we found statistical significance was in this question five among the PGY1s. This is likely relative to the small changes and also the limited group size. We didn't compare one group to another. Well, actually we did those comparisons, but it wasn't um, statistically significant. Okay. Uh, looking at conclusions, uh, as I described at baseline, the residents didn't show differences between groups that were meaningful and they all fell within one point of each other. Um, and interestingly for me, all groups scored pretty low on the understanding and application of attachment theory. Um, the average scores were closest to disagree on the Likert scale. To me, I think this is indication that it could be a way to bolster our um, education and residency. Um, regarding our primary aim, this brief intervention did not show efficacy based on the subjective reports in this six month period. They did show improvements in the second aim of improving the understanding of attachment theory. However, this improvement was a seen across all groups regardless of receiving our targeted intervention. This could be because, I mean, the PGY2s progressed over six months. They also had one class where they did talk about attachment theory outside of our intervention, um, or maybe the by intermingling within the group, they, they talked about attachment theory more commonly um, in their class. Um, only the PGY1s showed that statistical significance mentioned. And overall, the study suggests that our residents at baseline don't significantly differ in their understanding of patients and attachment theory, and that the Understanding of attachment theory increased over the six month period, but it was regardless of the intervention. Um, and while it does show that residents tended to disagree, they have a, that they have a good understanding of attachment theory, we, we didn't demonstrate an effective brief intervention to improve these, these measures. As far as future direction, um, something that I'd like to do and I plan on doing is just resurveying these PGY1s at a year later. So I kind of saw that they improved over six months. And if I see that they continue to improve over a six month period, you know, maybe even go into the positive range on these questions four and five, um, I think that would be adequate evidence to say that the intervention was beneficial, that they, you know, grew beyond what their peers um, had that would be in a similar place um, if they hadn't done it. Because the PGY2s, at, at, you know, early in their year, they were still in this kind of negative category. All right, um, well, I'm open to any questions and I will probably be wearing a different shirt. Thanks.
Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Any uh, questions for Dr. Arant? Hi, Nick. Uh, this is Gagan. You definitely are wearing a different shirt. Yeah, thank goodness. <laughs> Uh, great job. Um, question, um, do you think um, the intervention you described was adequate to meet what you were hoping uh, to achieve with this intervention? Uh, in short, I think that our intervention uh, could have been stronger um, to teach a chat attachment theory in one classroom session, um, that might be too tall of an order. Um, I was hopeful that by, ha by showing that, it's a that we're able to do it in one session, it would, be, uh, it would feel a little bit more appetizing or feasible for our residency as far as, I mean, kind of the big goal of this is to potentially have a, a course in first year and that could even be a single um, discussion. But I agree, if we were to talk about attachment more, more in depth over maybe two or three sessions even, um, then I believe our results would be more robust. My, and just a personal thought on that, I actually find attachment theory to be pretty intuitive once you hear it. Um, maybe that was just due to some of the other understandings that I have. Um, and after trying to like com compile a lot of the attachment theory, I, I had a feeling that it would be, that I could go over it in one session, but in practice, I think two or three is uh, more reasonable. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Arndt, um, Jason Curry here. I'm wondering how generalizable you feel this uh, method that you took is, say, if you wanted to see how residents did with some other subject matter, whether it was differentiating antipsychotic medications or teaching about interpersonal social rhythm therapy, do you think that there are maybe other targets that may potentially be more successful than what you saw with attachment theory? I think it's a great question. I didn't know that my program director was listening in, um, but yes, I mean, I think that this is a great way to look at, you know, if, uh, if we're looking to introduce a new topic or a new teaching point, um, it would be a very methodical way to kind of take a look and examine if it actually increases residents' understanding. I think I, one of the limits of our study is that it was over a six month period and kind of as I talked about in my hopes for the future, um, just looking at these, really any of these types of questions on an annual basis, you know, if I could ask the residents, how, how sh you know, how comfortable are you with, you know, prescribing antipsychotics and look at PGY1 versus PGY2 versus PGY3, and then have an intervention and see, you know, how the slope changes, if that changes the trajectory on more of an annual timeline, I think that would that would provide some cleaner results um, that would be um, more easily generalizable. Thanks, Dr. C. I actually have a question. This is uh, Joanna Kowalik. So how did you come out, maybe I missed that in the presentation. How did you come out with the questions? How did you, you know, decide these are the questions going to answer my, you know, what I, what I aim for? Um, that, that's a great question. We, we have kind of been going through like a quality improvement course and essentially I had an aim statement and my aim statement to begin with was maybe a little bit too specific, which was to increase understanding of attachment theory and we decided to kind of make it a little bit more generalizable. Um, so that was kind of related to questions one and two, which was improve understanding of our patients. Um, I really, after like discussions with all the third year residents and um, two of our attendings that help us develop these quality improvement ideas, um, we kind of came up with these different uh, types of questions. But 
I mean, essentially what you see there is there's like the general understanding questions, which is one and two. There's attachment theory questions, which is four and five. And we included this, you know, difficulty with borderline patients um, as another measure as um, many of us agreed that understanding attachment theory actually helps us to better empathize with our patients with borderline personality disorder and to really be more successful in our work um, on an outpatient and inpatient basis. So you didn't see um, no significant difference, right? So what, how would you follow, like how are you planning on following up on these results? Uh, really my follow-up is to resurvey the the group that was PGY1s, I'll resurvey them at the 12 month mark, which is actually at Halloween, just um, around the corner here, and compare that to where their um, PGY2 peers were a year ago, um, essentially to see if the PGY1s, you know, continue to develop um, kind of beyond where we would expect our PGY2s to be in understanding attachment, um, or if they, you know, stagnated or kind of lost the knowledge that we've tried to, mm -hmm. uh, tried to impart. Well, I, I think this is really original too. And I think that, uh, I don't know if there's any like research that, well, maybe you, you look into it, actually looking at a resident's understanding of attachments. You know, I'm a child psychiatrist, so we spend more time <laughs> <laughs> on them studying attachment. So, so, but it's, I totally agree with you that it, this actually could help residents. Um, they have more empathy, understand, you know, that the struggle, you know, the, the emotional struggle, especially like with border minds, but, you know, there's other, you know, personality disorder or other disorders that would have the attachment component. Um, so I think it's a good idea to follow up and maybe like investigate. Well, I, yeah, I, I like that. So I, I um, Maybe I'm biased because <laughs> of child psychiatry, but but yeah, I think that uh, the early introduction and actually um, following up on this, you know, like with the structure of questions on residents, you know, understanding and and you know, it's it's very important because actually it it brings their attention to the you know to the concept of attachment because otherwise, you know, we, we get so busy with diagnosing and treating we don't actually think about some of the, um, you know, attachments or like defense mechanisms that actually affects our, um, you know, empathy and the transference and content transference. So, so I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Arndt for this, for this great poster and uh, have Dr. Fowles take us into our second. Those of us new to joining, um, if you'll, the uh, poster presentation is going to play as a video in the speaker window. So if you'll set your view to uh, speaker view, you'll see the, the video at its largest. And if you'll stay on mute until the Q&A session, I'm uh, turning it over to Dr. Files to introduce the next poster. All right, well, thanks again, Dr. Ryan. That, that was a great presentation and uh, good answers to the questions too. Our second poster is New Onset Psychiatric Disturbance Related to COVID-19 Infection and Management. And this one's presented by Dr. Gurmar Kaur at University of Arizona College of Medicine and Banner University Medical Center and secondary author, Dr. Neet Shah. So if you guys want to take it over. Sure thing. So my name is Dr. Kaur. I'm one of the third year residents at Banner University in Phoenix. And We're actually going to play your okay. recording. Okay. okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Gurmeher Kaur. I'm here presenting a poster of two cases showing a new onset psychiatric disturbance related to COVID-19 infection and management. The second author of this poster is Dr. Neith Shaw. We are both residents psychiatry residents at University of Arizona Banner University Medical Center in downtown Phoenix. We have no disclosures to report. A little bit of background about this case. 
COVID-19 has drastically affected the day-to-day -day of us as providers and our patients. COVID-19 has been described as causing a variety of neurological and psychiatric complications. Oftentimes, delirium is cited as a cause for altered mental status in patients that are hospitalized and infected with COVID-19. A meta-analysis has identified some rare neurological and psychiatric complications, including encephalitis and hypoxic encephalopathy. It examined patients infected with COVID-19 and found that there was evidence for delirium in about 65% of ICU patients, agitation in about 69% of ICU patients, and altered consciousness in about 21% of these patients. At discharge, it, one of the studies it reviewed showed that 33% of patients with COVID-19 that were assessed had a dis-executive syndrome. There's also been a UK-wide surveillance study of neurological and neuropsychiatric complications of COVID-19, which showed that 31% of patients presented with altered mental status, and of these, 92% were diagnosed with a new onset psychiatric condition. The cases we describe shortly show a variety of psychiatric presentations. One as commonly expected of psychosis secondary to steroid use, and the second case is of psychosis and paranoia that we be believe to be more primarily related to the disease process of COVID-19 infection itself. In the first case, I present case of present a case of a 37-year-old transgender woman. She has no past psychiatric history, but past medical history is significant for end-stage renal disease and chronic hypotension. She presented to Banner University with COVID-19-related pneumonia, and while hospitalized, she was treated with steroids for the treatment of this condition. Psychiatry was consulted to determine capacity to leave the hospital against medical advice. On assessment, she was alert, oriented to person, place, time, and situation. On psych ROS, she denied any depression, anxiety, or mania symptoms. However, she did endorse a new onset of auditory hallucinations during her hospitalization. A review of these medications showed that psychosis corresponded with initiation of steroids for the treatment of her COVID-19 pneumonia. This case kind of classically presents an expected scenario that we see with use of steroids. Steroids have been commonly shown to affect mood and other psychiatric components and also have been noted to cause situations such as psychosis, which this patient may have been experiencing. In the next case, I present a case of a 40 eight-year-old Hispanic man with no past medical history, no past psychiatric history. He comes to the emergency room with altered mental status and severe agitation. Uh, after presenting to the emergency room, he reports that he has attempted suicide by cutting his wrist before he came in. He states that this is because he believed he was infected with COVID-19 and felt that he was endangering others by being alive. At presentation to the emergency room, he had yet to be tested or treated for COVID-19, including any exposure to steroids. The medical assessment showed that there was multilobar pneumonia noted on chest x-ray, and then the COVID-19 did later come back as reactive. The psychiatric assessment showed that he was alert and oriented to person, place, time, and partially to situation, though this was limited by his, by his delusions. During hospitalization, he was agitated, requiring physical restraints. He was demanding to leave the hospital, stating that it was so he could leave and kill himself. He had a delusion that if he didn't end his life, that others would get sick and would possibly die. He did not have any history of depression, psychosis, or mania. Um, and this was confirmed with collateral. There was no family history of psychiatric conditions, hospitalizations, or any past suicide attempts in both the patient and his family. He had a supportive family, though at the time of the incident, 
He had been living alone and was somewhat isolated due to the national pandemic. While he was hospitalized, as the patient was treated for his pneumonia, his mental status and delusions improved as well. At the time of discharge, he denied any psychiatric symptoms and did not require any more psychotropic medications. In reflecting on these two cases and the background information that we already have about COVID-19, it's important to keep in mind that most patients infected with COVID-19 recover without experiencing any neurological or psychiatric complications. However, there are reports of new onset psychosis, affective disorder, and even rarely suicidality. In a study that analyzed adults infected with COVID-19, looking at a TriNet-X database, it's a global health collaborative clinical research database that automatically uploads um, information from EMRs. It analyzed about 40,000 patients infected with COVID-19. Of these, 22.5% had a neuropsychiatric manifestation. The most common psychiatric presentations included anxiety, mood disorders, and anxiety about 4.6%, mood disorders about 3.8%, but 0.2% of these patients did experience suicidal ideation. When thinking about the amount of patients that we're treating with COVID-19 and how drastically it's affecting the population, this 0.2% can be a pretty significant number. Most cases of psychiatric disturbance in these cases are cited to either steroid exposure or delirium in the hospitalized patients. When we think about our first case, in the first and the second case, there wasn't any change in mentation. There wasn't any waxing and waning. And the second case was even without exposure to steroids. Some cases of decompensation are cited as somebody who has a primary psychiatric condition, now are stressed because of the pandemic, and are now experiencing more psychiatric conditions. While we have definitely seen some of these patients, the cases that we looked at um, did not really seem to have this. This could also be a consideration for someone maybe of a younger age or with a strong family history, but in reviewing the collateral for these two cases and their past psychiatric history, this seems to be unlikely. We do know that COVID-19 is known to affect the neurological processes, and these presentations may be more variable than we previously have noticed. We know that it affects smell and taste most commonly, but there's room for other neuroinvasive, neuroinvasive processes occurring as well. We may need to consider that COVID-19 infection itself could lead to new psychiatric complications for patients without a past history or steroid exposure or delirium as are most commonly cited. Up next are some of the references that I used. There is research kind of rapidly coming out, so it's a topic that um, is still very much developing, but hopefully this presentation can give us a little bit of insight into the different things we Finally, I look forward to discussing this more live with you guys. Look forward to answering any questions that you may have and getting your input about this presentation. Thank you. Very good. That was very well done. Very interesting. Um, any questions from the group? Yes, I, this is Dr. Nallen. I'm a child psychiatrist, but I wanted to know, was there any follow-up to see um, if this was a persisting uh, psychosis or if this was something that resolved once the COVID resolved? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's actually really interesting. Both of these cases were seen in the CL presentation when the patients were acutely hospitalized. Um, in my chart review, um, with one of them, the second case that had this develop, he, we had asked him to follow up with a psychiatrist, but him and his family both didn't think that that was something that was necessary and I think didn't want to. Um, it sounded like at discharge, he didn't have any more psychiatric 
symptoms that we could notice, but about a week later, he was it, from the, um, he followed up his primary care provider who was still within the banner network. So I was able to see the chart and they had some concerns that he was appearing somewhat hypomanic or something like that. And we're going to monitor him closely. So, you know, it's, it wasn't a psychiatric assessment necessarily, but it sounds like there might have been some lingering presentation that might require treatment in the future. And with the other case, um, that one, once the steroids started to kind of clear from the system, those symptoms seemed to go away. I have a question. Um, so did you, uh, how far, I mean, where in the, uh, in the COVID infections or the patients, like um, was it does this like within the week of COVID infection within couple of weeks. Sure. So the patient with that was exposed to steroids, I think it was about the second week of the COVID infection when the symptoms started to get worse, they came into the hospital and were requiring more treatment. And the other patient, he really had not been diagnosed with COVID and was completely asymptomatic. So his presentation was much more psychiatric in nature, like a suicide attempt with no past history, really altered, really aggressive, delusional, where he had not had any of that behavior previously. So unfortunately, it's hard to, you know, tell what other, how long the COVID had been there, but they tested him as soon as he came into the hospital and they saw the pneumonia on chest x-ray right away. But we were called, I think, when he was still in the emergency room because of how significant his altered mental status and agitation were. So did you look at literature that there, is there anything uh, are talking more about uh, psych yeah. um, psychiatric symptoms and onset of COVID? Or Definitely, yes. Yeah. So there are, um, one of the studies that I looked at, which was the meta-analysis um, of a lot of the early literature that they have, they did show that it is pretty frequent, um, like 20 to 30% of times where there can be like an altered mental status type of pictures coming in. So when that breaks down into is this delirium, I think then it kind of gets a little bit, um, you know, it's harder to kind of pinpoint if it's just psychiatric. But I think it is an important consideration, <clears throat> like if somebody is coming in with just psychiatric symptoms out of the blue, without any history that it might be important to think that COVID could be a cause, even if they don't have a pneumonia or something like that. I think that was kind of what I seem to get from this, doing this research was that was something I would want to keep in mind as I saw patients in the CL service. One more question. Did you, I, I've, I've noticed I saw some uh, like um, uh, medical comorbidities, but did you also look like at obesity and like, you know, some other metabolic factors? I think it's hard for within these two cases to see how much of a role that necessarily played. Both patients were overweight. I wouldn't say like morbidly obese or obese. Um, the Hispanic gentleman did not have like hypertension and anything else, COPD. So it wasn't not as many co medical comorbidities as sometimes you would have expected someone. So. I think my case series is like a little too small and it, the literature is still coming out. So I, I agree. I, that's a really interesting point. If the psychiatric symptoms would be more in patients that have more of the medical comorbidities or maybe in those patients, is it more respiratory distress or something like that? Thank you so much. I think uh, that's our cue to go on for time to the next poster presenter. All right. Well, thanks again. That, that was good and very interesting. Thank you, uh, Kumar. And our third poster is the assessment of maternal acute stress disorder symptoms following NICU hospitalization. And this is presented by Dr. Marie Roy Babbitt of Creighton University School of Medicine, Valley Wise Health Center in Phoenix, with secondary authors Gilbert Ramos, Drs. Jennifer Waller, Tanya Feinberg, and Kathleen Matheson. So I will turn. Our new participants will start the presentation and will play by video. So if everyone will stay on mute and including our poster author until the Q and A session. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. My name is Marie Roy Babbitt. And I recently graduated from the Creighton Valley Wise Child Psychiatry Fellowship. My presentation is on a survey research project about symptoms of acute stress disorder in mothers in our Valley Wise Health NICU. So today we'll be talking about um, psychiatric sequelae for parents of babies in the NICU, including anxiety, depression, PTSD, and acute stress disorder. We'll talk about how socioeconomic status and refugee status influence uh, these outcomes and risk factors, and a very brief overview on interventions for PTSD in the NICU and what the outcomes are like for these parents. And we'll talk more about the survey, including methods, results, and our conclusions. So looking at the background information for this study, mothers of infants in the NICU are at increased risk for psychiatric disorders, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and acute stress disorder. Most of the prior studies in this area have included mostly women of higher socioeconomic status who also speak the predominant language in their country. However, uh, women who are immigrants or refugees um, have a higher risk of a lot of risk factors that contribute to NICU hospitalization, preterm birth, and post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, the purpose of this study was to work with our diverse patient population at Valley Wise Health and try to determine the prevalence of acute stress disorder symptoms in mothers of, of babies in our NICU. So looking at some of these psychiatric sequelae of NICU hospitalization, um, the studies that have been done have found elevated rates of depression and anxiety and have found that these symptoms persist for months. Uh, this study was looking up to six months after delivery. Uh, here's some similar information just presented in a graph form. And then looking at the right side of the screen, uh, this is a graph showing rates for mothers and fathers uh, and the percentage of parents who were above a clinical cutoff for significant anxiety symptoms. Again, starting right at birth, those rates are above 40%, but they're still above 20% about three months out. We see something similar for rates of depression in both mothers and fathers, again, starting out above 40%, still above 20% of the 12 weeks after birth. Looking more specifically at PTSD and acute stress disorder, again, we see that these rates are really high. Up to about a quarter of both mothers and fathers will report some symptom, significant symptoms of acute stress disorder. Up to a quarter of mothers will report significant symptoms of PTSD. And a lower rate, but still significant percentage of fathers. Interestingly enough, the infant's um, health status doesn't clearly affect this risk. That might just be due to a ceiling effect of having a baby being in the NICU being such an incredibly stressful event. The most common symptoms of PTSD that have been found in previous studies included hyperarousal, flashbacks to the baby's birth and admission to the NICU, and avoidance, in particular avoiding contact with the NICU. So again, looking at socioeconomic and immigrant um, status as risk factors. Immigrant mothers are have a lot of risk factors for postpartum depression, and a lot of these risk factors also influence risk of preterm birth and this NICU hospitalization. What we see is that mothers who are immigrants are at higher risk for this kind of poor social support, um, higher stress, and lack of support prior to delivery, and that this risk for preterm birth is higher, in particular for refugee mothers and those who have spent time in refugee camps. So to improve outcomes, we wanna increase the level of support for parents as much as possible and involve parents, including fathers, directly in their baby's care. The support can come from peer counselors, chaplains, lactation consultants, and other support staff, as well as from the nurses and doctors. There have also been structured interventions that have had good results, including the COPE program, which is CD and workbook based, as well as supportive therapy and directed writing interventions. So mothers um, who are at higher risk for persistent PTSD symptoms after the NICU hospitalization are mothers who have high anxiety levels, who are first time mothers. And these persistent PTSD symptoms can really affect mothers' experiences with their babies. Um, and also things like breastfeeding rates. On the contrary, parents who were doing well prior to hospitalization, unsurprisingly, tended to do better afterwards. 
Uh, this is really where we see that support from family, friends, and hospital staff as a major protective factor. So looking at our survey, this was an anonymous survey. We had both English and Spanish versions that we distributed in the NICU and in the primary care clinic. Uh, we distributed it to mothers who were 18 and older who had had a baby hospitalized in the Valley Wise NICU. Uh, and our NICU staff and social workers in the primary care clinic distributed these. So we collected a lot of demographic information, which we'll look at in just a minute. We asked about psychiatric history, obstetric history, and uh, asked parents to complete acute stress disorder scales for both traumatic birth and NICU hospitalization. Uh, we ended up not having enough data with the traumatic birth scale, so we focused just on the scale about the NICU experience. So here um, is just a sample of questions from the acute stress disorder scale. It's a 19 item scale um, rated on a five points from not at all to very much for various um, specific symptoms of acute stress disorder. So we did calculate a social risk score based on our demographic factors, including family structure, who our respondents were living with, their level of education, um, whether the primary income earner at home was full-time employed, part-time employed, or unemployed, what language is spoken at home, and then the mother's age uh, when her baby was born. So an elevated score was considered to be two or greater. Uh, we had 32 respondents. Uh, they were predominantly Hispanic, about 72%. Their average age was about 27. Uh, most of our participants spoke either Spanish or Spanish and English at home. And the majority had either a high school diploma equivalent or higher level of education at almost 90%. Here's some of that same data in a table form. So the majority of our participants, 65%, did have an elevated social risk score of two or greater. Um, and these participants were more likely to report a history of depression or anxiety, but were actually less likely to report a history of prior trauma or diagnosis of PTSD. Most 28 of our participants did complete the acute stress disorder scale related to NICU hospitalization. Fortunately, none of them met the cutoff score suggested for a diagnosis of acute stress disorder. Uh, possible scores on the scale do range from 19 to 95. Our average score was actually only 24.8. So most of our respondents reported that it was support from their partner, family, or the hospital staff that really contributed to their feelings of safety and um, both during delivery and during their stay in the NICU. And I included some of the specific comments that we got from our participants that just really highlighted how supported and how positively they viewed their interactions with staff in the NICU. Um, they mentioned things, they kept me up to date, they were so nice and positive. Um, my baby was cared by for staff who love their job. Um, they gave us care, attention, and love. They answered all of our questions. You can just feel um, how supported they felt during their experience. So for our conclusions, um, we did succeed in um, including a more diverse group of participants than in prior studies. Our uh, respondents were predominantly Spanish-speaking and Hispanic and did have elevated social risk scores but they reported low rates of acute stress disorder symptoms. Again, we saw that those relationships with hospital staff were so significant uh, and also that support from partners and family. So I think in the future, we would wanna really narrow in on what aspects of that support in the NICU were most helpful. Thank you very much. Here are my references. Very good and very well done. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Looks like we have one. Hi, uh, Dr. Singh here, for, uh, excellent presentation. Um, question, uh, the, as you think about parsing out what intervention the staff are doing that's supportive, what sort of ideas do you have and how would you parse it out Um, I guess I would be curious how much of it is kind of education on like what to expect and how to care for their babies uh, versus how much of it is, you know, like providing empathic listening um, or more of that like emotional 
kind of support. Um, and maybe if, if it matters, like who that support is coming from. Start your video if you'd like. Oh, okay. Dr. Babbitt. Hi. Hi. Uh, so excellent presentation. Do you hear me? Yes. So I was uh, wondering if you did do, um, oh, by the way, I'm Payam Seder, one of the attendings at uh, Valley Wise. Crazy. Hi. And um, I wanted to find out if you had um, any idea as to whether these families, as majority of them were Spanish speaking, and I would imagine, uh, you know, from Mexico mainly, were they uh, legal residents of the country? And was there any factors there that was involved that could be a different kind of uh, support possibly? And that, did that play a role in them not being able to you know, cope better or not? That's a really good question. You know, that, that was not something we had asked about on the survey, but I think that that would really kind of get at the heart of um, you know, how stressed or how well supported someone might be becoming before coming into the hospital. Yeah. Whether or not, you know, they're established here and able to access all the services they need and not under that kind of immigration stress versus someone who doesn't have all those resources. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Rodabit. Uh, <laughs> And so you um, you mentioned that you look at the social stress like the factors. So um, or maybe I'm so. So how was the how how um, what was the average score for these participants? Oh, that is a really good question. I don't actually know that. No, I'm not sure. in front of me. I wonder if this would be the protective factors for um, you know. For, obviously, it is a protective factor for PTSD, so it could mm -hmm. be one of the confounding um, factors too. But very good, yeah. I, I think that's a very good question. Sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Hello, Dr. Roy Babbitt. Um, okay. This is Wendy Watson. Hi. Um, just and this is kind of um, just because I'm curious. I um, what. Uh, and just very briefly, um, what services did they receive upon discharge? They, like you mentioned something about there's programs to help support and, mm -hmm. and you know, I was just curious as far as what you've learned. Um, that's another really good question that I don't know the answer to. I'm not, um, I don't know all that our NICU offers after discharge. Um, the one study I think that had examined an intervention specifically after discharge was just this expressive writing study where I think they sent women these prompts, I think it was three months afterwards. Um, and the women were just supposed to do this journaling about their experience um, without the expectation of that being shared with anybody or processed with anybody. And they still reported that was helpful. Um, so I, I don't think it would have to be something complicated to be effective, but unfortunately I, I don't know what's in place right now. I, I appreciate that. I have a mother that's about to, that's going to have a baby that's going to be in the NICU. And I just want to make sure I'm supporting her correctly. So thank you. Hi, this is Gurjot Marwa. Hi. I, I, I had a question about, do you know how many, what percentage of these women were supported or had their, the significant other in their life or how many of them were single? Um, well, let's apologize. I'm still at work. I could, um, I should be able to pull that up, but it would take me a minute. Um. Okay. Roy Babbitt, Dr. Marwa, to, to get that statistic to you uh, after the poster session, just in the interest of no time. No worries. Let's yeah. do that. Well, I will email you about that. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about that. No worries. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I apologize. I'm 
not as well prepared. I'm still at work, unfortunately. You're doing fine. <laughs> it's a tough question there, you know? Yeah, and thank you for doing this presentation through all this. That's the most important thing. Oh, thank, you. thank you very much for you know listening and thinking so. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Maria. Great job. Yeah, it really was. Very, very good. Um, so that wraps up our resident posters and thank you all for doing it. They were actually really good. I'm, yes. They're, they're excellent. So th thank you all. I, uh, the judge is going to have a tough, tough time here, I think. Um, the, so we'll tally the judges sheets and announce the poster results later in the evening. Uh, we've got two final uh, posters uh, that are physician peer submissions. Uh, we start with a case report of stuttering induced by risperidone and chlorpromazine by Dr. Shabnam Sood. Video and then Dr. Sood live afterwards. Good evening. My name is Shabnam Sood and I'm presenting a case report of stuttering induced by risperidone and chlorpromazine. Stuttering is defined as a disturbance in the normal fluency and time patterning of speech which is inconsistent with the individual's age and language skill. It includes frequent and marked occurrences of sound and syllable repetitions, sound prolongations, broken word, audible or silent word blocking, words produced with excess of physical tension, monosyllabic whole word repetition, and circumlocutions. Developmental stuttering is more common and generally develops gradually in childhood or adolescence. In contrast, acquired stuttering may start suddenly at any age and factors implicated include stroke, brain tumor, head trauma, and other conditions causing disruption in brain functioning. One of the factors implicated in the causation of stuttering is overactive presynaptic dopamine systems in the region of the brain that modulate verbalization. It is a rare side effect of antipsychotic medication and this case report is of a patient who develops stuttering when treated with risperidone and clopromazine. Mr. F is a 37 years old African American male who had been released from jail a week prior where he was on risperidol. He has a previous history of schizoaffective disorder and amphetamine and cannabis use disorder who was sent to a crisis center after he was found lying in the middle of an intersection, chanting incoherently and making illogical statements. At the crisis center, he was given intramuscular injections of haloperidol and ativan and was then transferred to the hospital on an involuntary commitment process because he was largely uncooperative with treatment. On admission to the hospital, he was agitated and labile with paranoid and grandiose delusions. He was noted to have a severe stutter. He denied current use of drugs and alcohol, but has an extensive past history of amphetamine and cannabis use. His medical history was significant for hypertension and blood work revealed mildly elevated liver enzymes, but was otherwise unremarkable. He did not provide a sample for uterine drug screening. A review of his medical records revealed that he has no past history of having stuttering during childhood or adolescence. He has had four previous hospitalization. He was treated with haloperidol during the first two admissions. No stuttering was noted in his records. He was stabilized on paloperidol palmitate as an outpatient prior to his third admission, and he was not reported to have had any stuttering. Patient decompensated secondary to amphetamine use, and due to his increasing agitation and psychotic symptoms, he was taken to the urgent care center where he received chlorpromazine. He was transferred to the hospital for inpatient stay, and stuttering was noted on admission. During this hospitalization, he refused paloperidol. Haloperidol and valproic acid were initiated to decrease psychosis and to stabilize mood. Although his stutter improved, he had a poor response to haloperidol. This antipsychotic was changed to olanzapine with improvement in his psychosis. Some stutter was present at discharge. In a subsequent admission, one year later, he was treated with olanzapine and valproic acid. No stutter was noted at admission or during his hospital stay. During his current admission, Mr. F was started on respiridone and the dose titrated rapidly to 3 mg twice a day. Valproic acid was added to stabilize mood. He had good levels at 1000 mg a day. His agitation and psychosis decreased and two loading doses of paliperidone palmitate 234 mg on day 8 and 156 mg on day 13 were subsequently given. 
he became more coherent and complained about his stutter. Respiral was discontinued on 14 days and continued to improve until his discharge to a step-down unit eight days later. On the discharge, which happened on day 25, he had only a minimal stutter. Discussion. Stuttering was first noted to be caused by, pheno caused by phenothiazines, triflupyrazine and chlorpromazine in one patient and flufenazine in another patient in 1981. Clasbin appears to be most frequently implicated as a causal agent for stuttering in 16 cases. There are two mechanisms postulated for the development of stuttering with clasbin. Either it is a part of seizure activity or could be a variant of movement disorder. Drug-induced stuttering has been reported with other psychotropic medications, including antidepressants, desipramine, sertraline, and fluoxetine, benzodiazepines, including alprazolam and chlorazepoxide, and most stabilizers, including lithium. Risperdon has been implicated in the cause of stuttering in three cases. In a case reported by Lindquist, the patient had a past history of stuttering. It appears that the Risperdon reactivated the old speech pattern at doses of 4 mg. The patient's dose was increased to 8 mg to target psychosis, and the stuttering worsened. He was continued on Risperdon 8 mg and on day 48, both the psychosis and stuttering improved. In another case, stuttering was noted to be dose-dependent with the patient developing stuttering at a dose of 4 mg and higher. While the first two cases were patients who developed acute stuttering within few days of starting Respiradon, the third case reported that, res reported that Respiradon was used chronically. The patient had moderate mental retardation and was on low dose of Respiradon, one milligram a day for treatment of behavioral disorder related to perinatal asphyxia for two years and then developed stuttering. Our patient, Mr. F, experienced stuttering several times that improved and resolved once a Respiradon was decreased, suggesting Respiradon induced stuttering. He also had stuttering after he received intramuscular injections of propromazine. This is the first case report of a patient who developed stuttering in the context of both low and high potency neuroleptic medications. Various mechanisms involving multiple neurotransmitters have been postulated about the connection between neuroleptics and stuttering. Cholinergic mechanisms have been postulated since tricyclic antidepressants are seen to worsen or cause stuttering and trials of bethanicol, a cholinergic agent, have improved fluency. It is speculated that drug-induced stuttering may be a manifestation of akathisia leading to noradrenergic and serotonergic mechanisms being implicated. One-third of cases involve selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Neuroleptic-induced stuttering suggests that dopaminergic mechanisms may be another cause. However, this could be due to the intrinsic anti-muscarinic activity of low-potency drugs. In contrast, Respiradon is a high-potency drug that blocks the D2 and 5-HT2 receptors with no actions on the muscarinic receptors. It could be that either the dopamine or serotonergic system are involved or there is an imbalance of these systems after starting Respiradon that may be relevant. Respiradon-induced stuttering is an interesting paradox as Respiradol is also used in the treatment of stuttering. Respiradon improves stuttering symptoms by increasing striatal metabolism by way of D2 receptor antagonism. However, the use of Respiradon in the treatment of stuttering and the fact that stuttering occurs as a side effect of Respiradon is an interesting paradox and further studies are needed to clarify the mechanisms. Thank you. That too is very well done. It's excellent. And I uh, want to ask for any questions at this time. That was fabulous, I think. A very unique case of stuttering. I'd never, never thought of that. So very good, Dr. Sood. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Sood. Hey, it's Joanna hey. Komali. And hey. Did you look at, yeah, this is very interesting. Thank you for presenting that, that was really interesting. But um, did, they, did they do any like a case series on the stuttering and on the psychotics? 
Yeah. No, there haven't been that many case series, and the most cases have been reported with clozapine. Like I said, with Risperdal, there's only been three cases which have been reported. Mm. Wow. So, but this guy was interesting because still he said, "Oh, doc, I get stuttering with Risperdal. I never even knew that was antipsychotics cause stuttering." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's interesting. But yeah. That, that is amazing, actually. Yeah, that, that this could be the side effects, and it's actually interesting that you know the like the mechanism, you know, the pathophysiology behind it. Yep. So that was a great presentation, Shabnam. Um, I also wanted to ask you. I I thought I saw some in the history that he was using methamphetamines. Mm -hmm. So. Is there any association between the methamphetamine use? And there is a possibility, but this guy kept insisting that he hadn't used meth. So we cannot always rule it out because he was released from jail for one week. And then he got psychotic. While in jail, he was using Risperdal and there was no problems. He went to the urgent care center and got all the chlorpromazine. So it was a little bit of a bind to say whether he used drugs or not. There was no UDS. But there was a possibility that the clo the meth could have made the stuttering worse. Yeah, because I thought I had heard something about the methamphetamine use. He had a history. He just denied that he had used it this time. Good. Very good presentation. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. Um, on to our next uh, presentation. Yeah, and again, thanks a lot. That that was very interesting, very well done. Uh, our next case is uh, um, is authored by Dr. Sud and presented by Dr. Uh, Dhruv Kosla, medical student on differences in outcomes and involuntary commitment among various emergency psychiatric crisis centers, with secondary authors Dr. Emil Osipov, Dhruv Kosha. Gilbert Ramos, Jennifer Smith, and Dr. Bakash Batari. And this is a timely topic. Okay, and on to the video. Hello, my name is Dhruv Kosla and I'm an adjunct research associate with ValueWise Behavioral Health. And I'll be presenting this poster on COE outcomes among patients from different crisis centers for the Arizona Psychiatric Society 2020 annual meeting. So to begin, I'd like to talk about the background research surrounding the study. Involuntary psychiatric admission is an established treatment for patients who are acutely mentally ill and unable to recognize the need for treatment because they lack insight into their conditions. However, rates of involuntary admission vary across countries due to several reasons. Uh, for one, national legislation and the local structures that are put in place for mental health service delivery. Uh, two, professional ethics and attitudes. These are the attitudes and ethics of the mental health professionals treating these disorders public perception of the risks arising from mental health, fourth, the legal frameworks that are in place to facilitate mental health and voluntary admission, and some clinical features that have been associated with involuntary psychiatric admission include being male, having a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and lacking insight. However, there's limited information on differences in rates of involuntary admissions in the same jurisdiction. Some are linked to variations in diagnoses in diagnosis and severity of illness. So as I alluded to earlier, the practices surrounding involuntary psychiatric admission differ from place to place. And I'd like to talk about what it looks like here in Maricopa County. So here a petition is submitted to the healthcare agency, which are the crisis centers, uh, to establish reasonable cause for a petition for COE, which stands for court ordered evaluation. Patients on these COE petitions are subsequently sent to ValueWise Behavioral Health, uh, or VBH for short, which is the only hospital system in the county that receives these patients. The duration of the COE is 72 hours, or three days, during which two independent psychiatrists evaluate the patient and either agree that the patient needs court-ordered treatment, or COT, or they drop the patient from evaluation. However, there's little information on how many patients get placed on COT overall, there's not much information on differences in court outcomes based on the referring agency or the crisis center and what the implications are for the treatment of this acutely mentally ill population. So there were three distinct aims of the study. 
The first was simply to determine the amount of patients that are getting placed on court-ordered treatment. The second was to compare the court outcomes for patients that were referred by the three crisis centers. And the names of the crisis centers are the ones in parentheses, CPEC, RIES, and UPC. The third aim was to compare the timing at which the patients were released off the COE petitions. And there were three distinct intervals at which this was done uh, before the 72 hours had elapsed, between filing and prior to the court date, and at court. And this was done for all three of the crisis centers. So now I'd like to talk about the specifics of the study. The patients included were all, all admitted to three separate value-wise behavioral health facilities, Mesa, Phoenix, and Maryville, all in the month of November 2019. And the list of these patients admitted and the referral agency from which they came is all included in the psychiatry department's daily admissions report. The referral agencies are, of course, the three crisis centers that I mentioned earlier, CPEC, RIAS, and UPC, other hospitals, and then also the Department of Corrections and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. The chart review was all done on EPIC, which is the electronic medical records system used by ValueWise Health. And the data that was collected was the demographics of the patients, the diagnoses that they were assigned, and their COE outcomes. And the statistical method used for calculations uh, were the frequencies, and they were calculated using the chi-squared test. This is the in-depth breakdown of the demographics of the patients that were admitted in the month of November 2019. So in total, there were 351 patients that were admitted to the three VBH facilities. And of these, 298 of the patients were eligible. And these are the ones that were admitted from the crisis centers. Uh, the ineligible patients, and there were 53 of these, all came from the other hospitals or from the DOC and the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office, or they were minors, so they couldn't be included in the study. And the gender distribution, uh, of the patients, there were 173 male patients, 122 female patients, and three that identified as another gender. And the patients ranged from 18 to 80 years of age. This table summarized the referrals from the crisis centers, and it shows the amount of patients each crisis center referred to each of the ValueWise behavioral health facilities. So if you look at the topmost row, CPEC referred nine patients to Maryville, 50 to Mesa, and 17 to Phoenix, which sums to 76 patients, which is about a quarter of the patient population included in the study. If you look at the bottommost row, it shows you the total amount of COEs that each VBH facility admitted. So Maryville admitted 138 patients, Mesa admitted 108, and Phoenix admitted 52, which totals to 298, which is all the patients that were included. This is partially explained by the size of each of the facilities. Maryville has the largest bed capacity and Phoenix has the least, so the numbers follow that trend. The same goes for the geographic distribution of the crisis centers compared to the VBH facilities. The VBH facilities that are closest to a particular crisis center tended to receive the most amount of patients from that crisis center, which makes sense. So this bar graph gives one piece of the results, which is the difference in diagnoses made by the crisis centers and those made at VBH facilities. And these diagnoses have been grouped into five different classes on the bar graph. You can see all the way on the left that schizophrenia spectrum disorders were the most commonly diagnosed conditions at both the crisis centers and at VBH facilities, followed by bipolar disorder diagnoses. I'd like to direct your attention to the category that says non-DSM-5, and this is almost entirely comprised of mood disorder diagnoses. And mood disorder is actually no longer a valid diagnosis based on the DSM-5 criteria. So in the future, these numbers should hopefully be reduced to zero because mood disorder is no longer a valid diagnosis. Another significant aspect of our study was the focus on substance use diagnosis. Substances can have a significant effect on mental health, but if a patient only is diagnosed with a substance use disorder and not a major psychiatric condition, then they most likely do not require acute inpatient hospitalization or court-ordered treatment. And so we wanted to see if there is a difference in the way VBH facilities and the crisis centers were diagnosing substance use and whether that had an effect on the COE outcomes. So at the crisis centers, 95 of the patients had a substance use diagnosis. And when, in one of the patients, this was the primary diagnosis, meaning that the patient most likely didn't need core order treatment. At VBH facilities, 159 of the patients were found to have substance use diagnoses. And of these 159, 78 of them, which is almost half, uh, were also noted by the crisis centers as having a substance use diagnosis. So of the VBH diagnoses, about half of them agree with uh, crisis center diagnoses based on substance use. And in five of these patients, this is the primary diagnosis. And the notable finding here is that more patients, about 32.7%, with 
with a substance use diagnosed, substance use disorder were released off the court ordered evaluation as compared to those without a substance use disorder. However, the, this, this, is, this difference was not statistically significant. So these are the significant results from the study. In terms of the core outcomes, almost 70% of the patients were placed on COT and slightly under 31% of the patients were dropped or dismissed prior to their mental health court hearing or at the hearing. The probability of being dropped off the court ordered evaluation across the three crisis centers was statistically significant, and this was confirmed using a chi-square test. This is important information and is reflected in the bar graph to the left. You can see that the blue columns for CPEC and UPC come out to be about 26.3% and 25.2% respectively, and that's the percentage of patients that they referred that were not placed on court-ordered treatment. However, if you look at the blue column for RIAS, located between CPEC and UPC, it comes up to be about 41.4%. So you can see that RIAS has a significantly higher amount of patients that they referred that were not placed on court-ordered treatment. This graph relates to the third aim of the study that I described earlier, which is to figure out exactly when patients are being dropped off of the COE. And so this graph follows a similar format as the last one. It shows the three crisis centers and then the total, uh, but this is now based on when the patients were dropped off the COE. And of interest here is RIAS again, which had the most patients that were dropped between the 72 hour evaluation period and the court date at 16, compared to nine patients from CPEC and 13 from UPC. And you can see in the total columns that patients are most commonly dropped between this period of 72 hours and the court date, followed by at court. So this graph shows something a little different. It shows the court outcomes by VBH locations. And the important thing to note here is that the probability of being dropped off the COE petitions was not statistically significantly different across three VBH sites, unlike the three crisis centers. So you can see in the blue columns on the graph that at Maryville, the probability of being placed on COT was 63%, at Mesa it was 72.2%, and at Phoenix it was 78.8%. So these differences were not statistically significant. So now I'll recapitulate and discuss the major findings of the study. A significant number of the patients, almost 31%, did not get placed on COT, which was statistically significant. Of those who were released off of the COE, 63% were released prior to court, and the other 37% of the patients were dismissed in court, either due to lack of witnesses or poor testimony by the witnesses. Now for the differences across the crisis centers. Riaz had the maximum number of patients released from the COE. Overall, this was about 41.4% released as compared to the other two crisis centers, which were at 26.3 and 25.2% respectively. Those were the pink and blue columns I was directing your attention to three graphs previously. Riaz also had the highest percent of cases released in the 72 hour period with 31.7% of patients versus 15% at CPEC and 12.9% at UPC. Across the three VBH facilities, Maryville had the highest number of patients at 37% who did not get placed on COT versus Mesa, which is 27% and Phoenix, which is 21.2%. But the differences between these three facilities was not statistically, was not statistically significant. So there are a few major conclusions to be drawn from this research. Our study showed that there were variations across the three referral agencies, the crisis centers, which were statistically significant. In contrast, the rates of release from the COE from the three VBH sites differed but did not achieve statistical significance. Factors that should be studied further in future research would include clinical features such as substance use diagnosis, which is diagnosed significantly less at the crisis centers in the study, severity of symptoms, other comorbidities, quality of evaluations, and whether or not collateral information about the patients was obtained. Attitudes towards court-ordered evaluation is another factor that would need to be considered in future research. Thank you for listening to this poster presentation. Here are the references to the previous studies we cited. Well, that was that was very interesting, very informative, and um, it's a timely topic. Um, so I'd like to open it up for any questions. Yeah, I thought it was an amazing uh, re paper. Actually, that was wonderful, and, and I'm glad that you know you started questioning these things because I've been at the inpatient facility for ten years and. You know, I've always wondered about these numbers, and this really gives me a very good canvas to uh, measure things. Uh, and I think 
You did an amazing job. Uh, the one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, like in terms of differences between the facilities, uh, as you mentioned, the substance use disorder, I think that really does play a significant role because at Maryvale, we do have more drops, but I also think we probably do have a lot more substance use associated with the public uh, or the patients that we get. Now, I wanted, I didn't catch that part to see whether there was uh, any difference as to uh, each location of the, uh, the urgent care facilities, whether they would send more to one of the uh, facilities or was that just evenly distributed? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sater. That's a great question. And I'm glad that the, the research is proving useful. Of course, you have to take it with like a small grain of salt because this was only calculated for November 2019. And so, you know, VBH facilities have been running for many years. And so this only gives us one month. So if it was done for a longer amount of time, we would definitely have a more accurate picture of how many patients get COT'd, for example. Uh, in regards to your question about the, the facilities and the crisis center referrals, um, so it differed. Were you just asking about how many patients each crisis center referred to each VBH facility? Yeah. So CPEC referred the most to Mesa with 50 patients. Riaz referred 69 to Maryville. And then UPC referred 60 to Maryville. So like I was mentioning earlier, part of it is based on just the bed capacity of the hospitals. And Maryville is the newest facility and it has the most beds. So it makes some sense that they're getting a lot of referrals. But also geographically, that plays a role as well. Um, the Christ centers that are closest to the VBH centers are probably more likely to refer to the closer VBH facilities. Great, good job. You Thank go. you. Other questions? Um, uh, my name is Joe Bloom. Can, can you hear me there? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I really want to congratulate you on studying civil commitment. I've been doing it for, I'd say, probably close to 50 years. And uh, these different factors that lead to outcomes are really important. So it, it was hard for me to get your whole study. So if you could get in touch with me, or Terry knows how to get in touch with me, I'm a professor at the... Uh, U of A here in town, and you have a pencil there? Yeah, yeah, I, I can note down. Okay, my, my email address is bloomj, B-L-O-O-M-J, mm -hmm. at O-H-S-U dot E-D-U. That's an Oregon, that's my old uh, email, but I still use it here. So I have a lot of data on civil commitment, and... You could help me and maybe we could uh, go a little bit further with this because um, the civil commitment process here is very interesting. And um, I'd like to talk to you some more about it. So maybe you could send me your, uh, send me the poster. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Uh, I have the link actually in Successful as a YouTube video. I know Terry has it, so she can probably pass it along. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay, great, thank you. You know, it's really something um, we can talk more offline, and, but it's something that, that we've been thinking about creating a small work group to focus on this um, because the, just my opinion, you all may disagree, but the, the law that supports the process here is quite old and quite outdated and results in some structural things that keep people in the hospital way far longer than they, they may need to. And at, and if they refuse treatment, you can't treat them. So it's, it, there's, there's a lot, I, I um, and, and we can get in talk further, but there's a, uh, you know, you mentioned the three UPC like facilities. There's also, you know, the crisis response network that feeds into all those. And there, it's, you know, one of the things at, here in Maricopa County, at least there is a system, a crisis system and there's actually a lot more, there's other data that you might be interested in too and might be able to make some sense of that uh, others historically have not been able to. So lo love to get you two guys involved and others who, who want to join at some point. That's great, it's terrific.
So I want to thank everybody for a great poster session. And, and I, like I said, as I said before we began, I especially want to thank the poster authors for their strong work and being resilient in adapting to this format. I actually think in this sense, because uh, in a live meeting, posters are tucked away in a, in a corner where people are trying to navigate to. I, I hope that we got you a broader audience and and uh, more people to hear this message. I know some may have 